only one I'm not real strong on is parenting because I never called the guy back that I was supposed to talk to. But I have some points on parenting. I have like all the different town zoning maps. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. It, it's interesting. I'm. Yeah. Give me one more second. We'll wait for. There's no more pie. Meredith. I think it's good. I think it's working. I'm sorry, it is not working. That's okay. It's one of those issues that, like, literally everyone cares about, but mm -hmm. try to get people out when there's nothing, like, mm -hmm. there's no building on fire. Oh, should we let just light like something? <laughs> I mean, as, <laughs> as a former volunteer firefighter, I can't. Do you know anyone ever suspect me of anything? <laughs> You can start. You can start at will. Okay. Card is the card is working. The video is taken off. It's good. Okay. Are we recording? We are recording. Okay. So welcome everybody to the informational meeting that the library has so kindly offered to sponsor for us. Um, I am representing the Webster Open Space Committee. Um, we are a group which has existed since about 2019, and we are working towards preserving open space in Webster really raising awareness within the community of how Webster could work to ensure that the open spaces we currently have, which are unprotected, are to the best possible extent preserved and protected for future generations. Um, open space is an interesting issue because it is something which everyone in Webster I think increasingly so over the past 20 years, is very conscious of. We all agree that Webster is increasingly overdeveloped. I think um, everyone also agrees that open space is something that they value. There is just some disagreement, um, perhaps at a town level, perhaps also in the minds of different people, as to how best to address um, that priority in the best interest of everybody involved, so landowners, developers, and the rest of the community. So, without further ado, let's begin our presentation. All right, so open space in Webster and beyond. I thought we would start out with a nice inspirational quote um, from the man, you may have heard of him, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed um, and implemented uh, the existence of Central Park. And I like this as an opening quote because I think it really captures the essence of what open space planning and open space preservation is all about. You think about New York City and how incredibly developed it is now as opposed to when Central Park was set aside as public land. It would be impossible to carve out or preserve a space like that now given how developed it's become. So I think in the best case scenario, open space planning is done with foresight. It's done when you still have, to use Meredith's analogy, a lot of pie left, okay? So nobody's really threatened when you take a big piece and set it aside for the good of all. I like also that this quote captures the essence of what open space is all about in the sense that it is about pleasure. It is about quality of life. It's about connecting to um, something beyond ourselves we all, I think, in Webster really value our parks and value our trails and value the fact that there is still a large part of town that you can drive through and you feel like you are in the countryside. It's beautiful. It makes you feel good inside. You don't feel like you're hemmed in and you're driving through development after development after development. So I think a really good analogy of that is, you know, he's talking about workers who couldn't afford to go anywhere else apart from this central park. Well, in the pandemic, our parks and our trails really took off and, you know, those parking lots were packed. And I think that really, you know, brought home to people when you can't go anywhere else, 
being in nature just outside you know, your back door is really, really important. So that, I think, is a perspective um, that, fortunately for the people of New York City, Frederick Law Olmsted had, and the city planners agreed with him. Unfortunately for Webster, we haven't always been as prescient. So what, is, what does that sort of um, mean? Why do we still have to value it? Why do we still have to make it a priority? Is it something that we even need anymore, given that we you know, have Webster Park and we have Whiting Road and we have the parks by the lake? Well, I would argue that even from a principal abstract perspective, it is still incredibly important. It's something that we should always be striving to, to achieve because there are still places that are worth preserving, and without them, Webster would be a significantly more developed place. If you can imagine all of the different farmers' fields, all of the different woodlots that are currently undeveloped but not protected as either parkland or conservation easements, imagine all of those as subdivisions or plazas. Webster would be like the more developed parts of Henrietta or of Arondequoit. Okay, and that, that significantly alters the natural character of the town. So, natural spaces are essential to our quality of life, and I think that we need to recognize the value of a natural space, not just as a park that you can go hike, but as something which should be integral within your day-to-day -day life. It's something you should be able to drive past, walk through, um, see just on your daily commute, see when you go to the store, feel that you are not driving through plaza after plaza after plaza. There are ecological benefits, obviously. Not everyone is a tree hugger like me, I realize that. But they are many. You know, trees clean our water, they clean our air. We have streams that run through the town that need to be protected. Wetlands, which should be developed around with little pockets delineating them. They should be preserved as a whole for the ecological benefit that they um, confer. We also have wildlife in our town, which is really under threat. Um, there was a Facebook post this summer um, of people who were looking at mange, mange suffering foxes and not knowing even what the animals were. Far be it for me to um, explain the cause of the mange, but the animal control department had to put out a bulletin and explain that this was the cause of development that these foxes were in our backyards. Meredith will remember last summer when the, where is it on here, when the plot of land somewhere around, there it is, State Road and 250 was developed, um, completely clear cut 40 acres of forest and habitat. All of the animals, it was like an exodus of wildlife into the village, okay, foxes were running down, you know, the street, it, it was, it was really, really bad. Um, so there is the wildlife, and whether or not you care about it, I think most people would probably agree they don't want foxes in their backyard if they have pets. So um, in addition to the ecological benefits, I think we also have to consider the economic benefits. I mean, this is actually a really interesting point. So as much as you know, we think of development as something which increases the tax base, that's only true for a certain kind of development. Actually, if you have residential development um, where the house value is less than a certain amount, it ends up costing the community in the long run with the burden on the infrastructure. Um, we've got a lot of bonds coming up now where the sewer system needs to be completely redone, the sewer plant, um, you know, the bus garage, uh, the roads. Everything costs money for the town when there are people in it, okay? Um, I know Peter loves the analogy of Victor having like more cows than people, or at least they did at one point, you know, cows don't cost money in school tax. So we keep open space, it actually ends up being a benefit in the long run. And also, it's an essential component, therefore, of any community's infrastructure. And because of that, it's the responsibility of the town, just like providing us with water, with um, electricity, with good roads, with a school system. It's responsibility of a, of, of a town to provide a community with an open space infrastructure. And that shouldn't just be a couple of parks that are only close to part of the people in Webster. This needs to be something which we think about as an essential resource that should be integrated throughout the town, throughout all of the developments. And so we need to think about what are some solutions, how can we ensure
sure that open space is something that we provide for our community. By balancing, by coming up with solutions that balance the rights of a property owner to sell their land, the right for the developer to do something with it, within zoning, within reason, and the rights of the community to still have as much of those resources as possible with that development still underway. Maybe some places are completely inappropriate for development and should just be purchased by the town in order to preserve them completely and, and wholly. But we'll get more into that when we look at the specific points in the Webster and the open spaces that it currently has as opposed to historically. In 1950, I still remember my grandmother telling me she went to a one-room schoolhouse. It was all cherry orchards and farms. She, in fact, met my grandfather picking cherries on one of the orchards. Um, we had 18,500 acres of open space. There were only 7,000 people. That's a third of a person per acre. We had 213 people per square mile. Fast forward to 2020, that number of open space has been slashed while the number of people has increased exponentially. And now suddenly, we feel a bit crowded. Okay, Webster is like a small city that hasn't planned to be a small city. I mean, we only just put sidewalks in a year ago. So I think that we've gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves with development, and we, and we almost have to sort of backpedal a little, bit, a little bit and try to integrate some of those essential components of physical um, quality of life infrastructure, which are necessary to a town this size. Okay. So, I love this. This is one of my favorite documents, is the 1974 Open Space Plan. This came after Webster started becoming increasingly suburbanized. Um, my mother, first she lived in, um, on DeWitt Road in, in one of the first suburban neighborhoods in Webster, one of the first subdivisions. And then in 1972 or three, my grandfather designed um, one of the houses that was built on West High Vista. So they grew up in that track that used to be cherry orchards. Um, I actually met my best childhood friend because she grew up in a house on Cherry Hill, named as the trend will become for what was cut down to put the houses in. And in 1974, whether it was the conservation board or just a few people um, that were working for the town or citizens like myself, realized that if something wasn't done, if there wasn't some green space set aside, then Webster was going to experience total build out. And I love what it says. Many of Webster's first suburban residents came here to escape the crowded urban environment of the city, but the city has followed. In some cases, not much thought was given to the need to preserve some of Webster's original character, the very environmental quality that attracted people to the town. And this is still true 50 years later. Okay, we, we have development after development, which has completely destroyed a lot of the natural character, which interestingly enough, not only was mentioned in 1974, but it was mentioned in um, the open space study, which followed off the heels of this. It was mentioned in the 1938 comprehensive plan, the 1968 comprehensive plan. There have always been people that have tried to sort of sound the warning bell and say, hey, you know, we've got some beautiful stuff here. But Time and time again, they've come up against the adage of you can't stand in the way of an individual right to profit. You can't stand in the way of an individual right to profit. And it's that black and white thinking that has to be either the individual's right to profit or preservation of open space that I think has really resulted in the kind of build out that we've experienced in Webster. Um, I think there is a reference here that is also a reference in, it might be the 68 Comprehensive Plan or one of the other open space studies of the 70s, but just how valuable our woods are, how we had some of um, you know, the original old growth hemlock forests that were um, characteristic of Monroe County, how we should really be preserving them, um, how important it is, you know, not only for an ecological aesthetic value, but just even from a, of a geological historical value. Um, we haven't completely listened to that, um, but I think there is a nice point here that I would like to, like to read. First of all, trees are beautiful. People have a natural love and affinity for trees. 
Trees provide oxygen, stabilize the earth, cut down on noise, protect the underground water table, are attractive buffer zones, and provide homes and food for wildlife. They also add value to property. I think everyone would agree that a house in a neighborhood that has beautiful trees in it is probably more attractive than a house in a neighborhood that has a giant golf course down lawn rolling behind it where people are never outside in their backyards because they're on full view to the motorists and their neighbors passing by, okay? So it's interesting as well, when developers do clear cut an entire uh, wooded area to put up houses, is that they replant sad looking little individual trees that are like 20 feet apart with no understanding of the fact that a forest exists as a network. Um, but at least there's an awareness that somebody will want a tree at, in their home. So I think one of the points that I'm unintentionally making here that we will be making a little bit more explicitly later is you can have a development. You don't have to clear cut to make the development. And, and there are developments like that. One immediately that comes to mind is Gasberry by Hightower. That has some beautiful old trees because they weren't clear cut. Um, there's a couple neighborhoods between on, off of Holt before you get to Clem, north of 104. Also, old, older trees still in those. So it is possible, and I think it does add value to the home. All right, so what did we do? How have we sort of fared open space-wise? In the mean, meantime, I will just say really quickly that 1974 open, uh, open space plan, that was never enacted. Yeah, we just ignored it. This is a map, you can't really see it very well, but if you do look closely, and I will encourage you to do that after the presentation, you can just see how little development there still yet was. I mean, there are huge swathes that are undeveloped. And you can also see how the forests and the floodplains that they delineated um, are now running over, have, have just been developed. So we didn't really heed that map at all. Okay, so in 2001, um, 26 years, 27 years after the 1974 plan, um, as somebody who currently works for the town um, explained to me when discussing it, it felt uh, for everybody at the time in the 90s that the sky was falling, right? It was, it was a huge amount of development in the 1990s. A lot of subdivisions, a lot of houses, um, developers were making a lot of money, and woods were being cut down left, right, and center. So all of this stuff right here, where you can see it's just literally all black with the lines of property, there is no open space which has been left between each of these developments, okay? That, that I think, is a really crucial point to make right here while we're looking at this map. Because when you look at the zoning maps, and this isn't the zoning map, but it still shows the same point. When you look at the zoning maps of other towns, they do have a different look. Even in the most crowded subdivision areas, there is still a portion of it that has been left undeveloped. We started to do that with park districts, but the problem with that, obviously there are hassles for the town in that as well, but the problem from an open space perspective is that there is no stipulation as to what a developer can and can't do with the land that he leaves open. And there's also no stipulation, unlike Pittsburgh, who does differentiate here, for what part of the land constitutes open space. So you can have that be all of the unusable stuff that a developer could build on anyway and say, here, town, you can have that as a park district. Um, and you can also clear cut it all, have it all just be lawn and say, yeah, that's your park district. But it doesn't really function as open space because it doesn't have any of the natural features that make us go, ah, nobody looks at a lawn and has the same feeling as when they look at a wooded area or you know a rolling agricultural scene okay it doesn't have the same effect because it's manicured it's something that man has made it doesn't give us that same connection so anyway 2001 all of this you can see under consideration still quite a lot that was open but not under consideration apparently because it was developer owned or already being developed this was webster's first stab at an open space plan we went big and then we had to go home because it got voted down. And it got voted down in part because people were uncomfortable with the amount of money. So it was a 22 million bond. It was double what the same consultants had previously spent probably two years prior at Pittsburgh. And it also didn't explicitly tell people which properties they were getting. And I think people also um, 
a gentleman who was here on Monday actually was a member of the previous Veteran Space Committee. It also focused a lot on um, development rights. So it was heavily focused on a lot of the agricultural land and people were uncomfortable with the idea that we're just paying farmers so they can keep farming and this isn't like you know, woods, it's not things we're gonna be able to walk on. Um, so there was that. And then developers also, two days prior to the vote, put out uh, a pretty powerful set of, um, I wanna say propaganda, because according to um, the chair of the previous Open Space Committee, a lot of what was on that flyer that they sent out of Syracuse so they couldn't be traced as Webster developers, a lot of what was on there was actually false. Um, but it scared people enough, and whether or not that had a significant effect, um, people voted it down. So, a couple years later, or in fact, the very next year, the town just hit the ground running. They said, okay, we're going to pare this down. We're going to focus just on land that people can access. And that is where Second Stab comes in. And I apologize for the um, low resolution on this. But essentially, this was where we got um, a good amount of farmland, but not everything that was on the um, 2001 map. Okay, so we purchased development rights, and we still have that. You'll see it on the open space um, map um, that I will show you in a second. And we also got Whiting Road and Gosnell off of that. So it was a $5 million bond. So it was a quarter of what we were going for before. Okay, but it did pass. So this is our current open space land. I do want to say it is disingenuous only because where this occurs on the town website, um, it says that all of this is forever wild and it uses this total acreage as forever wild. Well, everything in green is not forever wild because the program, as we'll see near to the end of the presentation, our open space tax abatement program, um, was annulled in 2010 because the way we had worded it in our code made it explicit that it was just a temporary tax abatement program, whereas it needed to be worded more as this is a permanent thing, it's a conservation easement, and the town is acting as the entity which is accepting and um, responsible for a federally recognized conservation easement. So, and that's actually, we'll see that it is written differently in the code of a town that still does it successfully. Um, but we decided not to renew it. Um, I know that the current um, will of the town, I've been told that we're not doing that again. I don't know why. I think it's a great way of encouraging people to keep their property open. Um, especially even if you think, well, there's no you know, proof or there's no, um, there's no way of forcing them that it's always going to be open and then the public doesn't get to use it. Well, guess what? If you're doing this and letting them get tax breaks for keeping it open, that's one less subdivision that you have to pay school tax for. That's one less subdivision that's going to be a drain on your sewer system and your everything else. So I think um, it does, it should still be something that we talk about and something that we push for and suggest. Um, there's no cost to the town really. It's actually a benefit, as we've discussed before, economically. And it makes everybody happy. And I think that's, you know, that's one thing just to sidebar and segue really quickly is if we can see the town actively implementing policy that on a wholesale level sought to preserve and protect open space, you just feel taken care of as a people. You would feel like your town government is listening to you, is looking out for your quality of life, isn't just trying to run things like a business, ignoring the fact that this is not a monopoly board, but is an actual town where people live, right? So I think that is that is a point. It's, it's as much about feeling like, you know, it's when they put the sidewalks in. Gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling. I was like, you know what, that's good. They're thinking about my experience, okay? We'll set aside the fact that where I live, I still have to walk on the shoulder and risk my life every time I want to get anywhere, but whatever. At least the people on bridge have a sidewalk, okay? So, um, this is the map of the preserved lands. Another thing I want to say, a lot of this red, the park districts, once again, not natural habitat, okay? We're getting no ecological benefit from a lot of that. And this is actually where we're sitting right now. This is this plaza. So just because the town owns it, right, doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, preserved and natural and wonderful, okay? I, I like that they cut out for the actual town hall building, but this is not. Um, all of this, I mean, there is a ball field and stuff back here, but this is like Ridge Park. But, I mean, most of this is a parking lot. So, 
you know, I, I really, I'm not sure how much. And I mean, this is the fireman's field, and I know it's wooded back here, but once again, you know, I mean, yes, we have use of it, but does the fireman's field really feel like open space? I mean, it's a public space, yes, that's great, but from the perspective of, you know, you're in nature and you're getting away from, you know, the civilized developed world for a little bit, I don't think it functions as that, neither does the parking lot. So anyway, so we'll take this number, you know, I, I was actually generous in my estimation. All I did was remove the 390, and I estimated that Webster now, well, we're going to come back to that. Webster now has about 2,400 acres of open space. So if you look at the numbers and you divide it out, um, as uh, the director of the Parks and Rec Department did at a previous town board meeting when telling us about how um, the work towards a referendum was actually just going to roll into a comprehensive plan update, it does look like Webster's doing pretty good. I mean, actually, we have more open space than in other towns. Uh, we have, um, you know, quite a bit more, actually. But if you look down here, it's kind of, it's actually on par when you take population into account. So why does it feel like when you drive through Pittsburgh, there's a lot more open space? Why does it feel like, you know, Parenton, for instance, Trailtown, USA, um, Penfield, huge amount of farmland. Okay, think of the commercial area in Penfield. There is that like plaza where the wagons is and stuff as you're getting towards Fairport, right? And then there's the four corners. Think of the commercial areas in Webster. I don't think, I can't think of Webster without immediately the plazas coming into my mind, the whole of Ridge, the fact that it takes almost 40 minutes to drive down. So I think the answer is why does it feel like Webster isn't so much over and above? right, or even necessarily on par, I think the answer is the way that the open space is distributed, okay? So when you look, let's see if I've done this right, okay, when you look at the numbers, if you take out the lake parks, okay, just think about where our open space is. We've got Whiting, we've got Gosnell, we've got Webster Park, okay? It's all up towards the lake. If you literally draw a line under, um, like, Shoemaker, South, we're like in development central here. It's like suburban city, subdivision, plaza, okay? All of the development, and I, the first town board meeting that I went to, and I won't name names, but one of the, um, one of the town board members, essentially, and this was to protest the cutting down of the woods, which is now the country max. And I said, this is crazy, that, that's a huge parcel of woods. You know, we lost a lot of habitat, and now there's gonna be even more traffic on Ridge. Country Max, nothing against them. There is more traffic now on bridge, and it isn't possible. I see people waiting for like five, 10 minutes to get out. Well, I'm not at that light for five or 10 minutes, but they look like they've been there a while. There's like a line of cars back into that Country Max parking lot. Poor traffic planning, okay, just as an aside, but there was no sense that this was um, something which was an ecologically, um, communally, community valued, um, parcel of land, there was no mitigation of how many of the trees cut, got cut down, there was certainly no respect to the water course. I mean, they reversed the direction of that stream. Last time I walked past it, there wasn't any water in it. So this is the type of thing that I'm talking about. There is this mindset, um, and what was told to me at that town board meeting when I went, was that we want to see Ridge, all of the development should just, Ridge is where the development should happen. So. I, I'm not a town planner, but to me that just seems like you're going to have a lot of traffic if you concentrate all of your development along a main artery from east to west through your town. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. And that does seem to, to be what's happened. So I, I don't know, but I do know that when you look at the commercial areas in Penfield, Parenton, and Pittsburgh, they take up a lot less geographical space than our commercial areas. And this could also be, maybe just to play devil's advocate, this could be a consequence of Xerox um, kind of capitulating a little bit. We lost, you know, a tax base there. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't make for a very pleasant experience when you live anywhere south of 104. Okay, so um, let's take a look here. So this is our zoning map. So this is kind of what I was saying. So you've got um, all of this. commercial, um, I can't, east of Phillips, I can't think, I don't think there's a lot, any, but this is quite a restrictive commercial um, zoning, but it's commercial 
which feels like commercial anyway, right? Because it's industrial, there's like buildings and stuff. And then you have all of this residential zoning, which allows for maximum density. And yet you also have little pockets, which were just kind of like put there. Coincidentally, as the developer was applying to put something there that wasn't an office park, um, you've got it there. You've got this kind of carved out of industrial. You've got R3 right up there instead of large lot. A little bit of R3 right there that allows a bit of higher density. Um, right in the middle of this, farmer's field, large lot, R2 subdivision. So it's that kind of LC2. Uh, randomly just right there. So I think it's that kind of um, exceptionalism um, that's happened. Why have zoning at all if you're just going to grant permission and grant um, exemptions to it? It really makes a mockery, okay, of the way that the code was written. It was written that way for a reason. The zoning exists for a reason. One of the stated aims of the office park was to preserve the woodlots along 104. Guess what happened to those woods? Clear cut. No more. Bye bye. And wetlands. Oh, it's wetland, they'll tell you. It'll stay protected. If you go in these apartments, you will see these sad little delineated patches of woodland cut off from all the other woodland. I think I have a picture on my phone. It was just like ridiculous that anybody would even think that this was protecting the woodland. Um, so, so that's, I, I think, kind of the point I want to make about Webster zoning. I am going to try to go a little bit quicker here. Um, Penfield, okay, a lot more space, all right? Now, Penfield has a similar situation to us in that they have concentrated their development um, to the sort of one side of the town. But you actually have um, all of this rural residential, rural agricultural, and what I'm not seeing are exceptions. I'm not seeing these like in the middle of that. Okay, so that is, I think, a really important thing to know, that they've adhered to that. And I think it's also interesting um, as well that the commercial zoning in Penfield is consigned to, and this is a little bit fuzzy, it's like a couple little areas. It's most of it is not. I think um, this might be right here, but if you're driving through town in Penfield, think about that. Like, let's say you want to go to Shadow Lake, right? You drive down five miles and get there. You're not driving through Plaza, Plaza, Plaza. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a really good point, okay? All right, moving on. All right, so this is Parenton. What I like about Parenton, first of all, the colors make it really easy. Look what they've done with their um, cluster development. There is a huge amount of open space, and I think off the top of my head, there is something like a requirement where 30% of the parcel has to be donated back to the town as open space, so a developer can profit from it. And the argument would be, well, oh, that's just going to cost the landowner money because the developer won't want to pay as much because he's getting less land. Well, no, he's still getting the same development. It's just like with commercial development. You're not paying. Um, your price per acre will go up the less acreage you have, provided you can still do your thing. Look at Metro Mattress. That freaking plot sold for like a million bucks. All right? And that's like one acre, right? So I think that's the point that we have to get into our, our heads here, is it's not about the amount of acreage. It's about the thing that the developer wants to do. And there's no reason why he can't do that thing, right, on less land, right? With, with a subdivision, you just put the houses closer together. But that only works if you then really stipulate what has to happen with the land that's left over and where that land comes from. Okay? It can't be land that was unusable anyway, and it can't be something that you just clear cut and mow and have as grass. All right. And Pittsburgh. I love Pittsburgh. So I'm actually going to explain what Pittsburgh has done. So with Pittsburgh, in 1985, their zoning code adopted um, a regulation which required 50% open space from the parcels. Now, I hasten to add they did get sued, but the lawsuit was dropped, it was given up, because what people started to realize is that actually, 
all of a sudden, people did want houses near open space. So it ended up actually increasing property values, kind of like what I was just saying to you. It doesn't actually cut into anyone's profits when you require a certain amount of open space to be left over because people want to live in a beautiful, natural landscape, okay? Um, and there is also a sense in Pittsburgh that they want to preserve what is left, preserve what exists. There was an open space referendum. They spent $9 million on 1,200 acres, and that has resulted in there being quite a lot of working farms or not working farms, just beautiful open space. They have um, a kind of like public information signs up in front of these farms, the history of these farms, who's farmed these farms, walking trails, which connect a lot of these spaces. So they've turned it into an asset for their community, which increases the property values. And I think that's something to know. And also, look at all that open space within the subdivisions. Okay. I would be going on a little bit more, but I don't um, want to miss this um, last 15 minutes of point. So Webster's Cove. So in addition to zoning, okay, and the way that we have zoned, and the way that we have made exemptions, and the way that we have made a huge swath of town commercial, and the way that we have not restricted what goes into the open space and subdivisions, and the way that we have not tried to have parkland and open space um, integrated throughout the town, our code is actually pretty lenient towards development, okay? It hasn't, we're all aware of this. This is something that even the most um, pro-development people would be aware of. We, we are very uh, lenient, and the planning board in our town has a lot of authority, okay? It doesn't have to sort of check with other agencies. Um, it can approve things, it can waive checks, and our code doesn't make reference to habitat protection outside of a limited EPOD area, so EPOD, Environmental Protection Overlay District. We don't have any explicit requirement for builders to preserve existing habitat. We make no reference to our own conservation board. This is something that is present in the codes of other towns. Pittsburgh is, is one, I think Penfield also has it. Um, and that means that our conservation board, on their website it outlines what they're supposed to be doing, but our conservation board is not empowered. Their recommendations to the planning board are not a requirement for the planning board to take into account. They are summarily ignored. So they're essentially a toothless organization, um, which really only exists to, I think, reassure people that it exists and people think, oh, there's a conservation board. Things like, you know, wildlife habitat ecosystems must be being taken into account. Not really. Um, and that is something that we could add to our code and we could empower them. And that was something which was recommended Oh, 2008 in the comprehensive plan update and has not been followed. We don't require our planning board to adhere to our comprehensive plan. That is huge, okay? I mean, why would we? We don't follow anything else in our comprehensive plan, right? But in Pittsburgh's code, which everybody has um, in their subdivision code, um, if you look at, if you flip through until you find a Penfield, in fact, Penfield subdivision, time to go through everything the way that I wanted to, but if you flip through, bum, bum, bum. in fact, to the last page, I love it, the planning board shall review the application to determine that the application meets all of the requirements of these regulations, the zoning code, other applicable town codes, official town maps, the intent of the comprehensive plan, town master plans, and design guidelines of the town board, commissions, agencies, departments, and districts, and all town requirements and policies regarding street, street frontage, reservation of land, drainage, da, 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 da. Our planning board just has to make sure it complies with zoning. And if it doesn't, they'll just recommend that the developer go get an exemption from the zoning board of appeals. So there's that. And we also have this wonderful thing where the planning board can waive checks on developers. So let's, I'm gonna show you that on the next slide. We also don't require our uh, planning board to initially consult with other agencies. Okay. So, planning board procedures. Here we go. So this is Pittsburgh, and I love this. Okay. We have they have to do all of this stuff, and um, to promote the planning. So Pittsburgh, very much like Penfield, again, explicitly instructs its planning board to promote the planning objectives of the town's comprehensive plan. Okay. Um, and we also have an explicit instruction that the planning board 
should be mindful of preservation and protection of such natural resources and assets as lakes, ponds, streams, steep slopes, prime agricultural soils, flora fauna, the general scenic beauty, and historic resources of the town. Our, this is just in the purpose section of each of our subdivision regulations, ours just says, um, administer to ensure orderly growth and development, conservation, protection, and proper use of land, okay? But anytime you put something in, in a multi, like in, in, a, in a list like that, you are devaluing it. You're implying that um, the conservation of land is equally important as its proper use, right? And so then you go on to list things like, um, shall not cause a peril from fire, flood, and other, or other menace, okay? Adequate provision is made for light air, fire protection, Open land areas, okay, but once again, it's in a list. Recreation and other amenities. So, it's it's this is this is all the mention that we're giving. We don't talk about scenic beauty or natural resources. There's no heart and soul in our code, right? There's nothing which seems to really appreciate and recognize that Webster is more than a monopoly board. I mean, it's you know, it's really apparent the more you compare our code with other codes, how much we lack that sense of preserving quality of life, okay? It's almost like some of our code reads like a checklist to remind the planning board what they need to expect from developers and to remind developers everything that they have to have in their application in order to be approved. All right, and I love this. So this is a lovely Pittsburgh, okay, general subdivision requirements. They have to, all this, which kind of is similar to all that, right? You gotta meet all this. Pittsburgh, however, has developers, and I guess we do this informally. I'm not sure if it is formal, and I just didn't see it in the code, um, but developers do have to uh, contribute to essentially the parks fund, um, and also financial security, so they have to provide a bond. Now, that's something that we ostensibly do require our developers to do, too. If you look at here, I think it does, maybe it doesn't even, it doesn't even talk. Oh, letter of credit, there we go. But then, I love this. Waivers of any of the above provisions may be granted by the planning board upon application in writing and for good cause shown. Gee, Mr. Planning Board person, this is going to be really difficult for me as a developer and it might really delay my project. Could you please just waive all of these requirements? <sighs> okay, so our EPODs. This, the big thing that I want to make note of is that both Webster and Penfield have environmental protection overlay districts for woodlots. Huge difference. Webster's is confined to a very narrow set of woodlots that are just around the lake and the bay. Penfield, town-wide. It's all woodlots of five acres or more. And as a consequence of that, they have a very stringent, very rigorous tree preservation ordinance because they are recognizing that now that Penfield is, and remember the, the Penfield zoning map, there's a lot of development in Penfield still, okay, but it's just the way they manage it. They're recognizing that, you know what, we have taken, to use your analogy from poor Meredith, so much now of the woodlot pie that the rest that is left, you need to not clear cut. There needs to be a very careful management of those woodlots. And so if you actually look in depth in the Penfield EPOD code, there is quite a detailed instruction as for how the developer has to mitigate any any takeage that is over 10% of that woodlot's area, okay? So they got to plant like two trees to every one. They can't cut down a tree if it's over a certain size. We've got a property right now, I'm not going to say specifically where it is, but it was in one of our YouTube videos, that is full of such trees. If it were in Penfield, it would not be a risk of being completely destroyed because somebody wants to make an astronomical profit and not require a developer to do any due diligence and actually work to get whatever he wants in there. Okay, so um, the very interesting also you can see is is the emphasis okay, in Penfield once again. Closing in 10 minutes. This harkens back to the comment that I made about our code not having any heart and any recognition of the quality of life that it's meant to be preserving. Penfield emphasizes the fact that this is just to protect the unique environmental features as much as possible, okay? Our emphasis, I love it, classic Webster. Remember what I said about, and this is the English teacher here, when two items are in a list, it devalues them, okay? We do mention the irreversible laws of 
natural resources, but most importantly, the loss of property values, because people in houses by the lake don't want their house value to go down, so let's protect the woodlots there. All right, the tax abatement scheme, this is super quick. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. Parenton still has theirs. What Parenton does is they write it as a conservation easement scheme. The same option for the landowner still applies. If they do it for up to 16 years, they only have to pay three years of the back. And that is a crucial distinction between the way that both towns um, have managed their open space tax abatement program, okay? All we would need to do would be to reinstate it as a permanent conservation easement scheme, and the landowner, if they, if they so chose, would be able to come out of it. But I think also there is, needs to be an understanding of the psychological effect of having something in the open space scheme. You get used to it. Your kids get used to it. It isn't necessarily that, oh, if there is an owl, people are just going to take it and it's just a temporary um, stopgap. This is a very real way of encouraging people to preserve their property, um, likely forever, provided they don't have to pay taxes on it, right? Because some people have to sell, right? Because they can't afford the taxes. Okay. Finally, future directions then. We need to embed environmental preservation within the ethos of the code. We don't live on a monopoly board, town government. Please recognize the fact that quality of life and open space are inextricably linked. Secondly, we need to codify more rigorous assessment for the planning board and negate their power to waive checks on developers. There need to be explicit instructions for all of the different things that a developer needs to demonstrate in an environmental protection overlay district, which is not just limited to the lake and the bay. Our forests are trees. We have very few left. There is no reason why they shouldn't be protected. We need to strengthen the EPODs for woodlots in order to achieve that, and I think we also should reinstate the tax abatement scheme by wording it as a conservation easement scheme. We need to ensure open space acquisition is a priority within the comprehensive plan, okay? If anybody hasn't seen this on the Webster website, it's right there. Okay, everybody should take this survey. As much as it's structured to emphasize um, development priorities, there are still questions where you have the possibility of answering with open space being a priority or quality of life, which is linked to open space being a priority. And crucially, there is a comment section at the bottom. There is also hard copies of this, and there are copies, there's a link to this on our website, Webster Open Space Committee, Google Sites, okay? Finally, We could also do a referendum. I won't put the map of all the lands that we achieved with that, how hard we worked on that, how we worked with the town for almost a year and a half on that. That has been shelved for now, but we do have a petition going where we have close to a thousand signatures, and I anticipate those signatures to be increasing. And we will be pushing that as an initiative coming up into next year. At the very least, signatures on that petition will demonstrate to the town that open space acquisition is a priority for people in Webster, and it is something that they need to take seriously. Okay, we can get individual parcels through existing funds, but that piecemeal approach is not a systematic approach, and there's still so much more that could be done at a town level to achieve what other towns have been doing for years. Okay, and we need to be active as citizens, all right? So just even liking us on Facebook, Webster Open Space Committee, even visiting our website, okay? Contacting us by email, asking us what's going on, signing up for our email alerts, going to the town website and paying attention to the bulletins. What projects are coming through at a town board, town planning board level that we might be able to feed back on and comment on and show our opinion on as a community? I think we often forget that we live in a democracy and these people are our elected representatives. Finally, I'm going to end with conclusions from the 1974 Comprehensive Plan. I want to make the point that it was their vision to preserve about 5,000 acres as open space before we rest on our laurels with our 2,400, most of which is in one part of Webster. And I also want to just read this last bit. This whole plan is oriented around the premise stated by Francis Bacon in the 17th century that we cannot command nature except by obeying her. For we pay too high a price when we try to disregard natural laws. Thomas Carlyle stated it clearly when he said, 
Nature keeps silently a most exact savings bank and official register correct to the most evanescent item, and at the end of the account, you will have it all to pay, my friend. Here's the rub. Implementation of this open spaces plan will reduce what must be paid at the end of the account. That was 1974. How much do we have to pay now for sewers? How much are we paying in school tax? Thank you guys all for coming. And um, anybody who's watching this on our YouTube channel um, or on Facebook, please like our page on Facebook. Please go to our website. Please be involved and pay attention because next year, we are going to be important as a community in this issue.